Hello friends. About 70% of the friends who watch my videos are not subscribed, and I would be very happy if you did. Also, don't forget to press the like button and leave your comments. Your interaction makes the content reach everyone and contributes to the growth of the channel. Thank you all. From which country or city do you follow the channel? My name is Lester Brandt, and I've been a park ranger at Norwood Hills for nearly a decade. It's a quiet, off-the-beaten-path kind of place, tucked away in the dense forests of northern Michigan, a stretch of wilderness so vast and unpopulated that it's not even marked on most maps. The park spans roughly 40,000 acres of pristine wilderness, dominated by towering white pines and ancient maple trees that have stood sentinel over these lands since before Michigan was even a state. The nearest town, Cedar Springs, is a good 30 miles away, just a handful of buildings clustered around a single traffic light, with a population that barely breaks 300 souls. I've always appreciated the solitude out here, especially after Sarah passed. After 23 years of marriage, losing her to pancreatic cancer left a void that no amount of social interaction could fill. This job became more than just work. It became my sanctuary, my escape from a world that suddenly felt too loud, too busy, too full of reminders of what I'd lost. There's something about the stillness of these woods that gives a man time to think, to reflect on what's important. The way the morning mist clings to the forest floor like a blanket, the sound of wind whispering through the canopy overhead, the occasional call of a barred owl echoing through the trees. It all helps put things in perspective. But there are also things out here that you wouldn't believe unless you saw them yourself. And even then, you'd probably doubt your own eyes, just as I still doubt mine, despite the nightmares that wake me in a cold sweat, despite the scars that prove it wasn't just a dream. Yesterday started like any other day on patrol. The calendar said it was October 15th, and the weather had that perfect autumn crispness to it, the kind that makes the air feel clean and sharp in your lungs. I'd spent the morning clearing fallen branches from one of our main hiking trails and replacing some weathered trail markers. Norwood Hills is dotted with a network of old logging trails, most of which have long since been reclaimed by the forest. Some date back to the 1880s when this whole area was being stripped bare by the lumber companies. My job is to keep them clear enough for the occasional hiker or camper who happens to wander into this neck of the woods though we rarely get more than a dozen visitors a month during peak season. There's no cell service out here, no amenities, just pure wilderness, which suits me just fine. It was late in the afternoon, around 4.30 p.m. according to my watch, when things started to go wrong. The sun was just beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long, thin shadows through the trees like prison bars across the forest floor. The temperature had dropped considerably and I could see my breath forming little clouds in front of my face. The air was still, the kind of stillness that makes you notice every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig. i just finished securing a loose board on one of our footbridges when I came across something strange. It was a clearing I'd never noticed before, which shouldn't have been possible. I'd walked every inch of my sector countless times over the years, knew it like the back of my hand. But there it was a perfectly circular opening in the forest, about 50 feet in diameter. Norwood Hills is full of surprises like that, hidden clearings, overgrown ruins of old cabins, remnants of lives long forgotten. But this one was different. The trees around it were twisted and gnarled, their bark blackened and warped as if they'd been scorched by some ancient fire. Their branches reached toward the center of the clearing like grasping fingers, creating an almost perfect dome overhead. The ground was bare, no undergrowth, no fallen leaves, just dark, rich soil that looked almost black in the fading light. In the center of the clearing was a large rock, smooth and black, its surface almost reflective in the dying sunlight. It stood about waist-high, perfectly oval in shape, like an oversized obsidian egg half buried in the earth. The surface had an oily sheen to it, seeming to shift and ripple when viewed from different angles, though it remained solid to the touch. My training and experience told me this wasn't natural. Rocks don't form this way, not in Michigan, not anywhere I'd ever heard of. I'm not one to spook easily. 
27 years in law enforcement before becoming a ranger tends to steal your nerves. But there was something about that place that made my skin crawl. The air felt different there, heavier somehow, like the moment before a thunderstorm when the atmosphere is charged with electricity. I stepped closer, feeling a strange compulsion to touch the rock, to see if it was as cold as it looked. Looking back now, I realize how foolish that was, how every horror movie cliché warns against exactly that kind of curiosity. But in the moment, I couldn't help myself. Just as I reached out my fingers inches from the stone surface, I heard a sound. It started faint, like the rustling of leaves in a gentle breeze. But there was no wind. Then it grew louder, more distinct, a low, throaty sound that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. It wasn't like any animal call I'd ever heard. And I've heard them all out here, wolves, bears, mountain lions, even the occasional moose. This was different. It was almost melodic, but in a way that set my teeth on edge, like feedback from a microphone, but deeper, more organic. It sent a shiver down my spine, and I immediately pulled back, my ranger training kicking in as I instinctively reached for the Glock 22 on my hip, standard issue for Michigan DNR officers. My fingers wrapped around the familiar grip, but I didn't draw, not yet. In 17 years of law enforcement and nine as a ranger, I'd only had to fire my weapon twice, both times at injured animals that needed to be put down humanely. But something told me this situation was different. I don't know what possessed me to stay in that clearing. Every instinct screamed at me to leave, to radio for backup, to get the hell out of there. But I felt rooted to the spot, like my boots had suddenly grown roots into that black soil. The air had grown noticeably colder, and my breath came out in rapid, visible puffs. Then I saw it, just beyond the edge of the clearing, between the twisted trunks of two ancient maples. It emerged from the shadows like oil seeping from the earth, its movements fluid yet somehow wrong, as if it were operating under different laws of physics than the rest of the world. The creature was crouched low almost on all fours, its body long and sinewy like a panther's, but with a strange, almost unnatural grace. It must have been seven feet long from head to tail, though its proportions kept shifting as it moved, making it hard to judge its true size. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, with a network of dark veins visible beneath the surface. Patches of rough, scaly texture covered its shoulders and spine, catching what little light remained in ways that seemed to bend and distort the air around them. But the most unsettling thing was its face, if you could even call it that. It was elongated like a horse's skull stripped of flesh, but with a narrow mouth that stretched unnervingly wide, filled with sharp, irregular teeth that seemed to jut out at random angles, more like shards of broken glass than anything natural. It had no nose, just a pair of vertical slits where nostrils should be, and its eyes, God, its eyes. They were huge, bulbous things, completely black except for pinpricks of white light that seemed to float within them like distant stars. I've seen all kinds of wildlife out here, bears, wolves, cougars, even a wolverine once, but nothing like this. This was something that shouldn't exist, couldn't exist in any sane world. It moved with deliberate slowness, circling the clearing as if it were sizing me up. My hand instinctively went to the radio on my belt, thumbing the transmission button. The static crackle seemed deafening in the unnatural silence. Base, this is Ranger Brandt. I'm at... I hesitated realizing I wasn't exactly sure where I was. The creature stopped its circling, tilting its head at an impossible angle, as if it had heard me despite the distance. Then, in a blur of motion that my eyes couldn't quite track, it darted toward me with frightening speed. I stumbled backward, drawing my Glock in one fluid motion, muscle memory from years of training taking over. The creature was covering ground faster than anything that size had any right to move. I squeezed off a shot, the muzzle flash momentarily illuminating the clearing like lightning. The report was deafening, echoing through the trees like thunder. The round struck the creature in its shoulder, or what I thought was its shoulder. Instead of blood, a dark, viscous fluid sprayed from the wound, sizzling where it hit the ground like acid on metal. The creature recoiled, not in pain, but in rage. It let out a screech that felt like ice picks being driven into my eardrums, 
a sound that contained frequencies that shouldn't exist in nature, that seemed to resonate with something deep in my hindbrain and trigger every primal fear response encoded in human DNA. I didn't wait to see what it would do next. Training be damned. I turned and ran. The forest that I knew so well suddenly seemed alien and hostile. Branches whipped at my face as I crashed through the undergrowth, my boots pounding against the leaf-strewn ground. I could hear it behind me, moving through the trees with that same unnatural speed. The sound of its pursuit was all wrong, no footfalls, just a sort of sliding, rushing noise like wind through a tunnel. My lungs were burning, chest heaving as I pushed myself harder than I had in years. I was 53 years old, in decent shape for my age, but I knew I couldn't keep this pace up for long. I needed shelter, somewhere defensible. The old ranger station was my only hope, a Depression-era building we'd stopped using regularly in the 90s when the new visitor center was built. It wasn't much, but it had solid walls and a door I could bolt. I burst through a thicket of young pines and saw the station's weathered frame silhouetted against the darkening sky. It was maybe 30 yards ahead, past a small parking area now overgrown with weeds. Behind me, the creature's screeching had taken on an almost triumphant note, as if it sensed my fatigue, knew I was reaching my limits. Those last 30 yards were the longest of my life. Every step felt like running through molasses. I could feel the creature's presence behind me, could smell something like ozone and rotting vegetation, an alien chemical stench that burned my nostrils. I reached the station's door, yanked it open, and threw myself inside. The door slammed shut behind me with a solid thunk that spoke of old-growth timber. My trembling hands found the heavy iron bolt and slid it home just as something massive slammed against the other side. The whole building shook with the impact. I scrambled away from the door, fumbling with my radio. This is Ranger Brandt, I gasped into the handset. I'm at the old station off Trail 7. Something's out here. I need backup now. Only static answered me, punctuated by bursts of that same otherworldly screech from outside. The station's interior was dark, lit only by what little daylight filtered through grimy windows. Old Forest Service posters curled on the walls and a thick layer of dust covered everything. My eyes locked onto the ancient Winchester Model 70 mounted above the defunct fireplace, a relic from when rangers had to deal with more aggressive wildlife. I grabbed it, praying it was still functional. By some miracle, I found a box of .30-06 cartridges in a desk drawer, their brass casings tarnished but intact. I loaded the rifle with shaking hands, the familiar mechanical actions helping to steady my nerves. The pounding at the door had stopped but I could hear something moving around the building's exterior, testing the walls, the windows. The creature was looking for a way in. I positioned myself facing the door, rifle braced against my shoulder, trying to control my breathing like I'd been taught at the academy so many years ago. The attack, when it came, was explosive. The door didn't just break, it disintegrated, showering the room with splinters. The creature filled the doorway its pale form seeming to glow in the dim light, those star-filled eyes fixed on me with terrible intelligence. I fired, the rifle's boom deafening in the confined space. The creature staggered, but didn't fall. I worked the bolt and fired again and again, each round striking home, but seeming to do little more than enrage it further. On the fourth shot, something changed. The creature's otherworldly shriek took on a different pitch, a sound of pain, of mortality. It collapsed, its form seeming to deflate like a punctured balloon. Dark fluid pooled beneath it, eating into the wooden floorboards with a caustic hiss. I kept the rifle trained on it, waiting for some sign of movement, but there was none. After what felt like hours but was probably only minutes, I approached cautiously, prodding it with the rifle's barrel. It was dead, really dead. In death it seemed smaller somehow, its fearsome appearance diminished, but no less alien. The smell was overwhelming now, a chemical reek that made my eyes water and my throat constrict. I staggered back, slumping against the far wall, the rifle clattering to the floor beside me. The radio crackled to life, making me jump. Ranger Brant, this is base. We're sending a team to your location. Hold tight. The voice was calm, professional, 
betraying no hint that they understood what had just happened. I couldn't bring myself to respond. I just sat there, staring at the thing I'd killed, trying to make sense of it all. When the response team arrived 20 minutes later, they came prepared. Hazmat suits, specialized containment equipment, not standard park service gear by any means. They worked efficiently, professionally, as if they'd done this before. The creature's body was sealed in some kind of container, loaded into an unmarked truck, and taken away. No one asked me any questions. No one took any statements. It was as if they'd been expecting something like this to happen. I drove home that night in a daze, my hands still shaking on the steering wheel. The next morning, I went to the park office and handed in my resignation. They accepted it without question, handed me my final paycheck, and wished me well. No mention was made of the previous night's events. When I tried to bring it up, I was politely but firmly told that all necessary paperwork had been filed and the matter was closed. I packed up my apartment that same day, threw everything I cared about into my truck, and started driving south. I didn't stop until I reached Kentucky, where my sister lives, found a job as a security guard at a shopping center. Nothing exciting, nothing that involves woods or solitude or things that shouldn't exist. But sometimes, late at night, I think about that clearing, about that strange black rock that started it all. I wonder if it's still there, hidden in the vastness of Norwood Hills. I wonder if there are more of those creatures out there, moving through the dark places of the world where people rarely go. And I wonder about that response team, about how ready they were, how unsurprised they seemed. I don't expect anyone to believe this story. Hell, sometimes I'm not sure I believe it myself. But I know what I saw, what I fought, what I killed. And I know that there are things in this world that defy explanation. Things that live in the spaces between what we know and what we fear. I just hope I never have to face them again. Some nights I dream about going back, about finding that clearing again and getting answers to all my questions. But then I wake up, and I remember the sound of that creature's screech, the look in those impossible eyes. And I know I made the right choice in leaving. Some questions are better left unanswered, some mysteries better left unsolved. Let someone else patrol those dark trails. I've had my fill of the deep woods and the secrets they hold. I never liked working the night shifts. They always made the world seem like a different place. Like the woods were holding their breath, waiting for something to happen. My name's Calvin Myers, and I've been a park ranger for almost a decade now. It's not the kind of job that makes you famous or rich, but it's the kind of job that makes sense to me. I grew up in these woods, learned to track deer and build fires before I knew how to ride a bike. My father was a ranger before me, and his father before him three generations of Myers men who dedicated their lives to protecting this slice of wilderness. The job gets in your blood, becomes part of who you are, like the rings in an old oak tree. Each year adds another layer of experience, another story to tell. Though after what happened that night, some stories are better left untold. The park where I work isn't one of those well-known national parks with postcard views and gift shops. It's a small, forgotten piece of land in the Appalachian foothills a place people pass through more than they visit. The kind of park that's more about keeping things wild than making tourists happy. We've got about 15,000 acres of dense forest, most of it untouched since before the Revolutionary War. There's a thick canopy of pines and oaks that blocks out most of the sunlight, creating a perpetual twilight even during the brightest days. The undergrowth is a maze of rhododendron and mountain laurel their twisted branches forming natural barriers that keep most casual hikers on the marked trails. We've got a few campgrounds scattered throughout, but they're rarely full, mostly used by serious outdoors people who appreciate the solitude. The locals call it the Forgotten Forest, and most nights that's exactly what it feels like. The night everything changed started like any other shift. I was in the ranger station, a weathered log cabin that stood sentinel at the park's entrance since the 1930s, going through my usual routine. The coffee was fresh, bitter, and strong enough to keep me alert through the long hours ahead. 
The radio crackled with static every now and then, but otherwise the night was quiet. Just the sound of the wind through the trees and the occasional owl, their haunting calls echoing through the darkness like lonely spirits. I was checking the weather radar, watching a storm system that was supposed to miss us to the north, when the call came in. The voice on the radio was shaky, uncertain. One of our campers reporting strange noises near the southern edge of the park, close to an area we usually don't patrol much. It's a tough spot to get to, where the terrain gets rough and the old logging roads peter out into nothing but deer trails and wishful thinking. Steep cliffs and thick underbrush make it more trouble than it's worth. But protocol is protocol. So I grabbed my gear, flashlight, first aid kit, radio, sidearm, loaded up the old Jeep, and headed out into the darkness. The drive out there took longer than usual. Recent rains had turned the dirt roads into a treacherous maze of mud and exposed roots, forcing me to navigate carefully around washouts and fallen branches. By the time I reached the campsite, the moon had risen high above the trees, casting everything in a pale, ghostly light. The campfire was dying, just glowing embers now, casting long, flickering shadows that made the trees seem to move on their own, like dancers in some primitive ritual. The camper who made the call was a middle-aged man named Roger Whitman, an insurance adjuster from Cincinnati, who had brought his family out for their first real camping trip. He looked rattled, his eyes darting around like he was expecting something to jump out of the darkness at any moment. I could see his wife and two kids huddled near their tent, the children clutching stuffed animals like they were lifelines against the darkness. The woman, Sarah, I'd later learn, was trying to maintain a calm facade for her kids, but I could see the fear in her eyes, the way her hands trembled as she held her children close. You the ranger? Roger asked, his voice a little shaky despite his obvious attempt to sound casual. The beam of his flashlight played across my uniform, lingering on the badge pinned to my chest. Yeah, I'm Myers. What seems to be the problem? I kept my voice steady, professional. In situations like this, calm breeds calm. He took a deep breath, glancing over his shoulder toward the woods. We heard something, something big. I don't know what it was, but it didn't sound like any animal I've ever heard. He paused, running a hand through his thinning hair. Look, I know how this sounds. We're city folks, right? Not used to the woods. But I've been camping before. I know what bears sound like what coyotes sound like. This was different. I'd heard this kind of thing before. People come out here from the city, and the darkness plays tricks on them. Every rustling branch becomes a stalking predator. Every shadow hides some nameless threat. Their imaginations run wild in the unfamiliar territory of true wilderness. I figured it was probably a bear or maybe a mountain lion, though sightings of those are rare around here. Still, something about Roger's demeanor, the raw fear in his voice, made me take this more seriously than usual. I'll take a look around, I told him, checking my flashlight's batteries. You stay here with your family. Keep the fire going. I'll let you know if I find anything. He nodded, but I could tell he wasn't convinced. I wasn't sure I was either. The forest beyond the campsite was like a wall of darkness, the trees pressing in close, their branches intertwining overhead to block out what little moonlight managed to filter through. The ground was treacherous, covered in roots and fallen branches that made every step an exercise in caution. The beam of my flashlight seemed to be swallowed by the darkness, barely penetrating a few feet ahead. About half an hour into my search, I started to notice something strange. The usual sounds of the forest, the crickets, the rustling leaves, the occasional distant howl, had stopped. It was dead quiet, like the whole world was holding its breath. That's when every instinct I'd developed over years in these woods started screaming at me that something was very, very wrong. And that's when I saw it. At first, it was just a shape, a shadow among shadows that seemed darker than the rest, more solid somehow. The beam of my flashlight caught something that made my blood run cold. It stood on four legs, but they were too long, too thin, more like the limbs of a spider than any mammal I'd ever encountered. Its body was covered in matted grayish fur, patches of it missing, revealing raw, pale skin beneath that seemed to pulse with an inner light. But the worst part 
The part that still haunts my dreams was its head. It was almost human, with features that seemed to shift and change in the darkness, and a mouth that stretched too wide, filled with row upon row of sharp, needle-like teeth. I froze, my heart hammering so hard I could feel it in my throat. Twenty years in these woods, and I'd never seen anything like this. The creature turned its head toward me with an unnatural fluidity, like its neck had too many joints. Its eyes, God, its eyes, were deep-set black pits that seemed to absorb the beam of my flashlight. But within those depths, I caught glimpses of something moving, something that reminded me of maggots writhing in rotting meat. And then it moved. The speed was impossible. One moment it was thirty feet away, the next it was almost on top of me. It didn't run like any four-legged creature should. Instead, its limbs moved in a horrifying, synchronized wave like a centipede, propelling it forward with terrifying speed. The sound it made as it moved was worse. A wet clicking noise punctuated by what could have been breathing, but sounded more like the gasps of a drowning man. I barely had time to react before it slammed into me. The impact felt like being hit by a truck, knocking me clean off my feet and sending my flashlight spinning into the underbrush. The beam caught the creature's movement in strobing flashes as the light tumbled, making the whole scene feel like some kind of nightmare movie. I scrambled to get up, but it was on top of me, its breath hot and foul against my face. The smell was overwhelming, like a combination of rotting meat and something chemical, something that reminded me of the formaldehyde from high school biology class. Its claws dug into my shoulders, and I could feel them piercing through my heavy ranger jacket like it was made of tissue paper. Each point of contact burned like ice, sending waves of numbness spreading through my body. In that moment, I was certain I was going to die. But survival instinct kicked in, and my hand brushed against something in the dirt, my hunting knife, which had fallen from its sheath during the impact. The blade was only six inches long, but it might as well have been Excalibur itself. I grabbed it and, without thinking, drove it deep into the creature's side. The resistance I felt wasn't what I expected. Instead of the solid mass of muscle you'd feel when stabbing an animal, it was more like pushing through layers of wet leather. The thing let out a sound that I'll never forget as long as I live. A mix between a screech and a hiss that seemed to reverberate inside my skull, making my vision blur in my ears. The creature recoiled its body contorting in ways that defied anatomy, giving me just enough space to roll out from under it. As I scrambled to my feet, I caught a glimpse of where I'd stabbed it. Instead of blood, there was a thick black substance oozing from the wound, and in the dim light, I could have sworn it was moving, trying to pull the edges of the injury back together. I ran. There was no shame in it, no hesitation. Every survival instinct I had screamed at me to get away, and for once, I listened. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the underbrush, its breath coming in ragged, wet gasps that seemed to be getting closer no matter how fast I ran. The forest itself seemed to be working against me. Branches whipped at my face, roots tried to trip me, and the darkness pressed in from all sides. My lungs were burning, and my legs felt like they were made of lead but the image of that thing's face kept me moving. The jeep was in sight now, its metal frame gleaming dully in the moonlight like a sanctuary. I threw myself into the driver's seat, slammed the door, and hit the ignition. The engine roared to life and I floored it, tearing down the narrow dirt path with reckless abandon. The headlights bounced wildly as I swerved around trees and over ruts, but I didn't slow down. I couldn't. In the rearview mirror, I caught glimpses of movement in the darkness behind me. Sometimes it seemed to be on the road, sometimes in the trees alongside it, moving parallel to my course. Its speed was impossible. No living thing should have been able to keep pace with a vehicle, even on these rough roads. But it did, at least for a while. I didn't stop until I reached the ranger station, the old wooden building that had been my second home for the past decade. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely get the key in the lock. Once inside, I grabbed the rifle I kept behind the counter, a .30-06 that I'd never had to use for anything more threatening than the occasional aggressive bear, and slumped down in a corner, keeping the weapon trained on the door. For hours I just sat there, listening to the sounds of the night. 
Every creak of the old building's timber made me jump. Every shadow that passed across the windows sent my heart racing. The rational part of my mind tried to make sense of what I'd seen, to fit it into some kind of logical framework. But there was no logic to what I'd encountered. It defied everything I knew about the natural world. Dawn came slowly, painting the sky in shades of pink and gold that seemed obscene after the horrors of the night. I forced myself to go back to the campsite, knowing I had a responsibility to check on Roger and his family. But when I arrived, they were already gone. Their campsite was abandoned. Tent and gear packed up in such a hurry they'd left behind a couple of the kids' toys and a camping chair. The only signs that they'd been there at all were the cold ashes of their fire and the deep ruts their car had left in the mud as they'd fled. I didn't blame them for running. Part of me wished I could do the same. But what I found just beyond their campsite made my blood run cold. The ground was torn up like something had been digging, deep gouges in the earth that looked more like excavator marks than anything an animal could make. And there, partially buried in the loose dirt, was a body. It was one of our regular campers, a man named Dave Henderson, who checked in three days earlier for his annual fishing trip. What was left of him was barely recognizable as human. His body was broken and torn, not like an animal attack. There was a precision to it, a deliberateness that spoke of intelligence rather than instinct. His face was frozen in an expression of terror that told me he'd seen what killed him, just as I had. I called it in, of course. Had to. Within hours, the quiet solitude of our forgotten park was shattered by the arrival of state police, park officials, and eventually the FBI. They cordoned off the area with yellow tape that seemed absurdly bright against the muted colors of the forest. Men in suits walked carefully through the underbrush, taking photographs and samples, their faces grim as they documented the scene. They interviewed me for hours, asking the same questions over and over until their words started to blur together. What exactly did you see, Ranger Myers? I told them everything, the impossible creature, its spider-like limbs, the face that haunted my dreams. I showed them my shoulders, where deep puncture wounds from its claws were already showing signs of infection, despite liberal application of antibiotics. The medical examiner who looked at them frowned, muttering something about unusual bacterial growth and tissue necrosis. They took samples, drew blood, prescribed stronger antibiotics. But I could tell by their expressions that they didn't believe my story. Not really. Could have been a bear, one agent suggested, though his voice lacked conviction. Maybe a pack of coyotes. Bears don't move like that, I said. And coyotes don't leave marks like these. I pointed to the gouges in the earth, the strange black substance that seemed to resist all attempts to collect it evaporating into nothing when they tried to take samples. They told me to take some time off, get some rest. Mandatory leave, they called it, though we all knew it was their way of getting me out of the way while they conducted their investigation. I went home to my cabin on the edge of the park, but I didn't rest. Couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that thing's face, those writhing black pits where eyes should be. The wounds on my shoulders didn't heal right. They left strange, spiraling scars that sometimes seemed to shift when I wasn't looking directly at them. The doctors couldn't explain it, just added it to the growing list of things about that night that defied explanation. Weeks passed. The investigation continued, but nothing came of it. They found no tracks, no DNA evidence, nothing that could explain what had happened to Dave Henderson. The official report blamed it on an unknown large predator, possibly a bear, though everyone involved knew that was a lie. I went back to work eventually. Had to. The woods were in my blood, after all. But things were different now. The darkness held new terrors, and every shadow could be hiding something unnatural. I kept the rifle close, started carrying silver bullets alongside the regular ones. Old legends say silver works against monsters, and at this point, I was willing to try anything. Then the second body appeared. Sarah Mitchell, a graduate student doing research on native plant species. They found her in the same area, torn apart in the same methodical way. The park officials couldn't ignore it anymore. They closed the park temporarily, brought in professional hunters and trackers, set up motion-activated cameras and infrared sensors, 
but they found nothing. Just those same strange gouges in the earth, and more of that black substance that vanished before it could be analyzed. The cameras did catch something once. Just a single frame of video, badly blurred but showing a shape that matched what I'd seen. The experts said it was a technical glitch, a trick of light and shadow. I knew better. The thing in that image had too many limbs, moved in ways that nothing natural should move. The park reopened eventually. Had to. Budget concerns and political pressure won out over safety fears. But they added new rules. No camping in the southern section. No hiking after dark. More frequent patrols. Not that it mattered. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't bound by our rules. These days I still work the night shift. Someone has to. But I'm not the same ranger who started this story. I carry more weapons now, though I'm not sure they'd do any good. I've installed extra lights around my cabin and the ranger station, burning away the darkness that thing seems to love. Most importantly, I watch. And I listen. Because the thing about monsters is, once you know they're real, you can't go back to pretending they're not. They're out there, hiding in the spaces between what we know and what we fear. And sometimes, on the darkest nights when the moon is hidden and the wind holds its breath, I hear something moving through the trees, something that walks on too many legs and breathes with the sound of drowning. I never see it directly anymore. Maybe it's learned to be more cautious, or maybe it's just toying with me. But I know it's there. I can feel its presence, like a weight pressing against my skull. Sometimes I find those gouges in the earth near my cabin, fresh ones, as if it's leaving me messages I can't quite read. The other rangers think I'm paranoid. They've heard the stories, of course. My encounter has become something of a legend among the Park Service. Most of them treat it as just that, a legend, a campfire story to scare the newbies. But they didn't see what I saw. They didn't feel those claws. So I keep watching, keep patrolling, keep my rifle loaded with silver bullets even though I'm not sure they do any good. Because I know the truth now. Our little forgotten park is hiding something ancient, something that was here long before us and will be here long after we're gone. Something that sees us not as threats or even prey, but as curiosities to be studied and taken apart with methodical precision. And on nights like tonight, when the darkness seems to pulse with its own heartbeat and the trees whisper secrets to each other, I sit in my cabin with my rifle across my lap and wait. Because I know it's still out there, still watching, still hungry, and sooner or later, it'll come for me again. When it does, I'll be ready. Or at least, that's what I tell myself in the long hours before dawn. But deep down, in the part of my mind that still screams when I remember that face, I know the truth. You can't fight something that crawled out of humanity's oldest nightmares. You can only hope to survive it. And even then, survival comes with a price. Every shadow hides a secret now. Every unexplained sound carries the possibility of terror. And the darkness? The darkness is never empty anymore. I've always had a complicated relationship with silence. Growing up in a noisy neighborhood in Cleveland, silence was a rarity. When I became a park ranger, I thought the quiet would be a relief, a way to escape the constant din of the city. But the silence in the wilderness isn't the absence of sound. It's a different kind of noise, one that creeps up on you and fills your mind with things you'd rather not think about. My name is Everett Carnes. I've been a park ranger for the past 15 years, stationed at Pine Creek Preserve, a sprawling 60 acre forest in the heart of Idaho. The preserve isn't exactly popular. It's one of those places people forget exists unless they're really looking for solitude or they're lost. The closest town, Harpswell, is about 50 miles away, and the nearest neighbor to the ranger station is at least a two-hour drive. It's just me, the trees, and the occasional lost hiker. Pine Creek isn't your typical forest. The trees are old, ancient even. Some of the pines are over 300 years old and their twisted trunks rise high into the sky like skeletal fingers. The air always feels heavy here, thick with the scent of pine and something else I could never quite place. 
There's a river, too, winding its way through the preserve, dark and cold. Its waters nearly black under the dense canopy. In all my years, I'd seen some strange things at Pine Creek. Unexplained lights in the sky, the occasional unidentified animal print in the mud, whispers on the wind that seemed almost too human. But I never paid much mind to any of it. The forest is old, I'd tell myself. Old places have old secrets. It was a late afternoon when I first noticed something was wrong. I was patrolling a less traveled part of the preserve, a place we called the Hollow, a natural basin. The Hollow is remote, even by Pine Creek standards. Visitors don't come here unless they're very lost, and it's easy to get turned around. The trees are thicker here, and the light doesn't penetrate as easily, casting everything in perpetual twilight. I was following a deer trail checking for signs of poachers when I found the first one. It was a rabbit, or at least what used to be a rabbit. The body was torn apart, pieces scattered around like confetti. The strange thing was the way it was done. Clean, precise, almost surgical. Not the work of a coyote or a bear. The cuts were too fine for that. I knelt down examining the remains more closely, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The bones were snapped clean, not chewed. And the flesh? It looked almost peeled away like someone had taken a knife to it. I've seen animal kills before, but this was something else. Something deliberate. As I stood up, the hairs on the back of my neck prickled. The forest had gone silent. Not just quiet, but deathly still. Even the usual rustle of leaves and the distant chirping of birds had ceased. It was as if the whole world was holding its breath, waiting for something. I heard it then. A rustling in the bushes just off the trail. I turned, slowly, hand instinctively going to the revolver at my hip. The sound stopped as soon as I moved, the silence rushing back in like a wave. I scanned the tree line, eyes straining to see through the dense underbrush. Nothing. Just trees and shadows. But then the shadows moved. At first I thought it was a trick of the light, but as I squinted I realized something was crouched there, just at the edge of my vision. It was low to the ground, almost blending in with the earth. My mind tried to make sense of it, but the shape didn't match anything I knew. It was large, the size of a man, but hunched over, as if it was crawling. The way it moved was wrong, jerky, unnatural, like it didn't belong in this world. Then it looked at me. I say looked, but I never saw its eyes. I only knew it was aware of me, that it was watching me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. It had no face that I could see, just a dark, featureless mass that seemed to absorb the light around it. The next morning I headed back to the hollow. I had to know if it was real, if I'd really seen what I thought I'd seen. The day was bright, the sun cutting through the trees in sharp beams, but even in the daylight the hollow felt wrong. The shadows were too deep, too dark, the air too still. Then I saw it again. This time it wasn't crouching in the bushes. It was standing, or at least something like standing. It was tall, impossibly tall, its limbs too long, too thin, like a spider that had learned to walk upright. The body was covered in what looked like fur, but it was patchy, uneven, with skin showing through in places. And the head, the head was the worst part. It was shaped like a deer's skull, but elongated, stretched out, with a mouth full of jagged teeth that didn't belong in any animal I'd ever seen. It was holding something in its mouth, a leg, human, the genes still clinging to it. I didn't think. I raised the gun and fired. The sound echoed through the forest, loud and jarring. The creature dropped the leg and turned to me, moving faster than anything that size should be able to. I fired again, but it was already on me, its long arms reaching out. I threw myself to the side, the creature's claws raking through the air where I'd just been. I hit the ground hard, rolling to my feet as fast as I could. The thing turned. Eyes, or what should have been eyes, locked on me. I fired again, and this time the bullet hit. The creature let out a sound, a high-pitched, almost mechanical screech and stumbled back, but it didn't fall. Eventually I transferred to a different park, one with more people, more noise. I tell myself that I prefer the company, that I've had enough of silence for one lifetime. But deep down, I know it's because I'm still scared of what I saw, of what might still be out there. 
They found Robert Stannard's remains a few weeks later, scattered across the hollow, picked clean. They never found the creature's body, but I know what I saw. In the end, they said it was some kind of unknown predator, something that had wandered in from God knows where. But I know better. It's something else, something older and darker. And sometimes things crawl out of the shadows that don't belong in our world at all. Sometimes in the dead of night, when the world grows quiet, I still hear that mechanical screech. And I know, somewhere in the depths of Pine Creek Preserve, in that place they call the hollow, something is still waiting, watching, hunting, and the silence. The silence is never just silence anymore. The government team arrived within hours of my call. They came in unmarked black SUVs, wearing civilian clothes but moving with military precision. The lead investigator, Dr. Sarah Chen, questioned me for hours about what I'd seen. She showed particular interest in the creature's movements, its anatomy, the sound it made. Have you noticed any patterns in animal behavior before this incident? She asked, her pen hovering over a thick notebook. Changes in migration, unusual deaths, anything out of the ordinary? That's when I remembered the past month's reports. Three deer found with their organs removed, precision cuts like the rabbit. A missing hiker from two months ago who was never found. The strange tracks by the river that didn't match any known species. They set up a base camp in the hollow. For two weeks, they combed every inch of the area. They took soil samples, set up motion-activated cameras, brought in specialized equipment I'd never seen before. They were looking for something specific, but nobody would tell me what. The official report called it an unidentified predatory animal, possibly a mutated mountain lion. But I saw how they handled the evidence. The way they quarantined the area where the creature's blood had spilled. The special containers they used to transport tissue samples. The armed guards posted around their mobile lab. One night I overheard Dr. Chen on the phone. It's similar to the Montana incident. Yes, same markers. No, the tissue samples are degrading faster this time. We need to consider the possibility of a nest. They shut down that section of the preserve for environmental restoration. Built a new fire road that conveniently blocks the main trail to the hollow. Installed surveillance equipment disguised as wildlife monitoring stations. The nightmares started about a week after the incident. Always the same. I'm back in the hollow, but the trees are different, twisted, wrong. The creature is there, but this time it speaks. It speaks with Robert Stannard's voice asking why I left him there, why I didn't come sooner. Sometimes I wake up screaming. Sometimes I wake up and can't move, convinced it's standing in my room, watching. I started seeing Dr. Matthews, a therapist in Harpswell who specializes in trauma. She suggested EMDR therapy, said it might help process the experience. But how do you process something that shouldn't exist? The panic attacks were the worst. They'd hit without warning, in the grocery store, at the gas station, once while driving. The smell of pine would trigger them, or a certain quality of silence. My hands would shake, my heart would race, and I'd be back there, watching those impossible limbs unfold. I couldn't let it go. During my last year at Pine Creek, I spent every free moment researching. I found old newspapers in the Harpswell Library, dating back to the 1800s. Stories of missing settlers, livestock found torn apart with surgical precision, strange sounds in the night that made people's teeth hurt. I reached out to other rangers, park services across the country. Most ignored me. Some blocked my number. But a few, a few had stories. A ranger in Montana mentioned something similar in 97. Another in Oregon talked about tracks they couldn't identify, animals found with their insides reorganized. All of them had been visited by teams like the one that came to Pine Creek. I started keeping a journal, documenting everything. The patterns became clear. These things, whatever they are, they have territories. They hunt in cycles, and they're spreading. I lasted one more year at Pine Creek before I requested a transfer. The new park is in Arizona, desert, no trees, no deep shadows, nowhere for things to hide. But sometimes when the wind blows just right across the canyon, I hear something that sounds like that mechanical screech. I still have Dr. Chen's card. She told me to call if I ever remembered anything else, or if I noticed anything unusual. 
I've thought about calling, especially after what happened in Yellowstone last spring, but some questions are better left unanswered. I'm breaking my silence now because people need to know. Not about the creature. The government can keep that secret if they want. But people need to know about the silence. About what it means when the forest goes quiet. When the birds stop singing. When the shadows move wrong. If you're ever hiking and you feel that silence fall. If you sense something watching you, don't try to be brave. Don't try to investigate. Run. Run as fast as you can toward civilization, toward noise and light and people. Because these things, they're patient, they're intelligent, and they're not just in Pine Creek anymore. I still work as a ranger, but now I spend most of my time behind a desk. The therapist says I'm making progress with the PTSD, but we both know I'll never go back to deep forest work. Some scars don't heal. Last week I got a letter from Dr. Chen, just a blank card with GPS coordinates written inside. Coordinates for a location in the Olympic National Forest. Below them, two words. It's spreading. I burned the card, but I memorized the coordinates. Someday, when I'm stronger, I might go there. Someday, when the nightmares stop, I might be ready to face another hollow. But not today. Today, I'll stay here in the desert, where I can see everything coming. Where the silence is just silence. At least, I hope it is. October 12, 1993 The morning frost crunched under my boots as I made my way up the familiar trail. Dawn was just beginning to break over the Appalachian Mountains, painting the sky in shades of purple and orange that would have been beautiful if I'd been paying attention. But something felt wrong that morning, wrong in a way that 20 years of hunting experience couldn't explain. My name's Miles Wetherill, and I grew up learning two things how to fight, and how to hunt. The fighting came from necessity. When you grow up in the south side of Pittsburgh in the 1970s, you either learn to handle yourself or you don't make it. The hunting, that came from my old man, James Wetherill, a former Marine who believed every man should know how to provide for himself. A man who can hunt can survive anything, he used to say, cleaning his rifle at our kitchen table. I was eight the first time he took me hunting barely big enough to hold the point two two he'd bought me. By the time I was twelve, I could track a deer through dense forest and take it down with one shot. By fifteen, I was a better shot than him, though he'd never admit it. I was forty-three that October morning, with more than three decades of hunting experience under my belt. I'd seen everything these mountains had to offer, or so I thought. The Remington 700 felt comfortable against my shoulder a familiar weight I'd carried through countless hunts. The scope was zeroed perfectly, the action smooth as silk. I'd spent the previous evening cleaning it, going through the meditative routine of maintenance that had become second nature. The forecast had predicted clear skies, but a heavy mist hung between the trees, reducing visibility to about 50 yards. I'd parked my truck at the old logging road turnoff, the same spot I'd been using since 85. The area was remote enough that you rarely saw other hunters, but not so far out that you'd have trouble getting help if something went wrong. I checked my gear one last time. Rifle, ammunition, hunting knife, first aid kit, water, emergency supplies. Everything was where it should be. I even had the new radio I'd bought after last season's close call when I'd twisted my ankle and had to spend an extra night in the woods. The radio probably wouldn't work. It never did in these hills but having it was better than not. The first sign that something was wrong came about an hour after sunrise. I was following what looked like fresh deer tracks when I noticed the silence. Anyone who spends time in these mountains knows they're never truly quiet. There's always something, birds calling, squirrels chattering, the wind in the trees. But that morning, there was nothing. The silence felt physical, like a pressure against my eardrums. I stopped, listening hard, trying to catch any sound at all. The mist seemed to thicken around me, curling between the trees like something alive. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, an instinctive response to danger that I'd learned to trust long ago. The tracks I'd been following suddenly looked wrong. They were deer tracks, sure, 
but something about them was off. The spacing was too wide, the impressions too deep. It looked like whatever had made them had been running, running hard from something. I knelt down to examine them more closely, my fingers tracing the outline in the soft earth. That's when I noticed the other tracks partially overlapping the deers. At first glance, they looked like bear tracks, but the size was all wrong. They were huge, easily twice the size of any bear print I'd ever seen. And the shape? The shape wasn't quite right. The pad marks were too angular, the claw impressions too long and curved. My first instinct was to radio for help, but when I pulled out the handset, all I got was static. Not the usual mountain static. This was different, a pulsing, almost rhythmic noise that made my teeth ache. I switched it off quickly, the silence rushing back in like a physical presence. I should have turned back then. Every instinct, every lesson learned from decades in these woods, was screaming at me to leave. But curiosity is a powerful force, and I'd convinced myself there had to be a rational explanation. Maybe it was a deformed bear, or some kind of escaped exotic animal. Things like that happen sometimes. Rich people buying illegal pets that eventually got loose. I continued following the tracks, moving slowly now, every step carefully placed to minimize noise. The mist grew thicker, reducing visibility to about 20 yards. The trees seemed different here. Older, their bark black and twisted, their branches creating patterns that hurt my eyes if I looked at them too long. That's when I found the first body. The deer carcass lay in a small clearing, and everything about it was wrong. I've seen plenty of kills in my time. Bear kills, mountain lion kills, even the rare wolf kill. This was different. The deer hadn't just been killed. It had been torn apart with a precision that spoke of intelligence rather than instinct. The wounds were clean, almost surgical in their placement. Key muscle groups had been separated, major organs removed with what looked like deliberate care. There was less blood than there should have been, and what blood there was had pooled in strange patterns around the carcass. I knelt down to examine it more closely, my hands steady despite the growing unease in my gut. The flesh was still warm, meaning whatever had done this was close. Very close. I noticed something else, too. Marks in the surrounding earth that looked almost like writing. Geometric patterns that seemed to shift and change when I wasn't looking directly at them. The smell hit me next. Not the usual copper and decay smell of a fresh kill, but something chemical like ozone and burning metal. It made my nose burn and my eyes water. I stood up, wiping my hands on my pants, and that's when I heard it. The sound started as a low-frequency vibration, more felt than heard, like the rumble of distant thunder. But it changed, modulating into something that resembled speech. If speech could exist without a human throat to produce it. The sound had patterns, rhythms that seemed almost familiar, but refused to resolve into anything recognizable. I raised my rifle, training it on the direction of the noise. Years of experience had taught me to control my breathing, to steady my hands even when every instinct screamed for flight. The mist seemed to pulse now, synchronized with that otherworldly sound. Movement caught my eye, something large, moving between the trees about forty yards out. The mist made it hard to see clearly, but what I could make out didn't make sense. It moved wrong, like something wearing a costume of an animal, but not quite understanding how joints were supposed to work. The creature stepped into a partial clearing, and my mind struggled to process what I was seeing. It stood upright, maybe eight feet tall, but its proportions were all wrong. The limbs were too long, too jointed, like someone had taken a normal animal skeleton and added extra segments. Its fur, if you could call it that, seemed to shift and change color as it moved, blending with the mist in ways that defied natural law. But it was the head that broke me. The face was almost canine, but twisted, elongated, with features that seemed to shift and change when viewed directly. Its eyes, though. God, its eyes were almost human. They held an intelligence that made my blood run cold. This wasn't just an animal. This was something that could think, plan, reason. I fired. The shot echoed through the trees, but the creature didn't react like a normal animal would. It didn't flinch or run. Instead, it turned those terrible eyes directly on me, 
and I swear I saw recognition there. Not just the recognition of prey, but something deeper. It was studying me. The second shot caught it in the shoulder, or where a shoulder should be. This time it reacted, but not with pain. Its form seemed to ripple, like heat waves off hot asphalt, and then it moved. The speed was impossible. One moment it was thirty yards away, the next it was almost on top of me. I caught a glimpse of teeth, row after row of them, set in jaws that opened far wider than they should, before instinct took over and I dove to the side. Its claws raked through the air where I'd been standing, leaving strange distortions in the mist. The official investigation lasted six months. The creature's body was taken to a facility in Maryland, but the results of their studies were classified. Jacks and I were interviewed countless times by various agencies, FBI, Fish and Wildlife, and others that didn't identify themselves. They tried to explain it away, an escaped experimental animal, a previously unknown species, mass hysteria. But I know what I saw. More importantly, I know what I felt. That thing wasn't just an animal. It was something else, something that existed in the space between what we think we know about the world and what's actually out there. Jax moved to Colorado after everything settled down. Last I heard, he was working as a guide in the Rockies. We talk sometimes, usually late at night when the memories are too strong to ignore. We never discuss that day directly, but we both know why we call. I sold my hunting gear, all except for my father's old rifle. That stays loaded in my closet, though I haven't touched it in years. The scars on my arm never healed quite right. They shift and change when I'm not looking directly at them forming patterns that remind me of the marks we found around that first deer carcass. Sometimes, when the fog rolls in thick and the world grows quiet, I think about those eyes. I think about how they studied us, learned from us. And I wonder if somewhere in those vast mountains, there are more of them, watching, waiting, learning. The official story is that we encountered an unknown animal species, now deceased. The media coverage died down, the scientific interest waned, and life moved on. But I know the truth. What we met in those mountains wasn't just an animal. It was something older, something that existed long before us, and will probably exist long after we're gone. I still live in the same town, but I never go into the mountains anymore. Can't bring myself to enter any forest, really. But sometimes, late at night, when the wind blows just right, and I catch a whiff of that metallic ozone smell, I wonder if it's still out there still studying, still learning. And sometimes, in my darkest moments, I wonder if it let us live on purpose, if everything that happened that day was just another kind of study for it. Because the thing that haunts me most isn't the memory of its terrible form or those impossible movements. It's the intelligence I saw in those eyes, the calculation, the purpose. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but sometimes, what doesn't kill you just leaves you changed. Changed in ways you can never quite explain to someone who wasn't there. Changed in ways that make you question everything you thought you knew about the world. I survived that day in the mountains, but sometimes I wonder if survival was really a victory. Because now I know what's out there. Now I know that the comfortable world we've built for ourselves is just a thin veneer over something much older, much stranger, and much more terrifying. And in the end, maybe that's the real horror. Not that monsters exist, but that they've been here all along, watching us, studying us, learning from us, and we never even knew. I never thought that a simple hunting trip would turn into a nightmare. But life has a funny way of throwing you into situations you'd never expect. My name is Arthur Grantham, and I've been hunting since I was a kid. It's not just a hobby, it's a tradition passed down from my grandfather. This time I had decided to explore the dense woods near Mount Rainier in Washington. The place was known for its thick forests and diverse wildlife, a perfect spot for hunting. The day started as any other. The morning air was crisp, and the forest was alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves. I packed my gear, checked my rifle, and set off into the woods. I had a specific spot in mind, a secluded clearing about two miles in where deer were known to graze. 
The hike to the clearing was uneventful, just the way I liked it. The only thing that stood out was the absence of any other hunters. Usually, I'd see a few familiar faces, but today it was just me and the wilderness. I reached the clearing around noon, set up my blind, and waited. Hours passed with no sign of any deer, but I didn't mind. Sometimes just being out in nature was enough. As the sun began to set, I decided to pack up and head back. The trail was easy to follow, and I made good time. I was about half a mile from my truck when I heard a sound that stopped me in my tracks. It was a scream, a human scream, echoing through the trees. My heart raced and I immediately turned towards the direction of the sound. I moved quickly but cautiously, scanning the area for any signs of danger. The screaming continued, growing louder and more frantic with each passing second. I found myself in a dense part of the forest where the trees seemed to close in around me. That's when I saw him, a man, or what was left of him sprawled on the ground, his body torn apart. The sight was gruesome, blood and entrails scattered everywhere. I felt bile rise in my throat but forced it down. This was no ordinary animal attack. A rustling noise to my left made me whip around, my rifle raised. There, standing about twenty yards away, was something I'd never seen before. It was humanoid in shape, but its proportions were all wrong. It stood well over seven feet tall, with unnaturally long limbs and a gaunt, emaciated frame. Its skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over its bones. But the most horrifying part was its face, or rather, the lack of one. Where its features should have been was a smooth, featureless expanse of skin. It let out a low, guttural sound that sent a chill through me. This was no bear or wolf. This was something else entirely. I fired a shot, aiming for its chest, but the creature moved with incredible speed, dodging the bullet and disappearing into the trees. I didn't wait to see if it would come back. I turned and ran, sprinting towards my truck as fast as I could. The forest seemed to close in around me, every shadow a potential threat. When I finally reached my truck, I jumped in and locked the doors, my hands trembling as I started the engine. I drove like a madman, not stopping until I reached the nearest town. I burst into the sheriff's office, babbling about the creature and the dead man. Sheriff Milton, a grizzled old-timer who'd seen his fair share of strange things, looked at me skeptically but agreed to send a deputy to check it out. Deputy Collins and I drove back to the spot, my mind racing with thoughts of what might be waiting for us. When we arrived, the scene was just as I'd left it, except for one horrifying detail. The body was gone, and all that remained were the bloodstains and pieces of torn clothing. Collins radioed for backup, and soon the area was swarming with law enforcement and search dogs. The dogs picked up a scent and led us deeper into the forest, but the trail went cold after a mile or so. We found no sign of the creature or the man. It was as if they had both vanished into thin air. The sheriff called off the search as night fell, and I was left with more questions than answers. Back at the station, I gave a detailed statement, but without any physical evidence, my story sounded like the ravings of a madman. The sheriff suggested I go home and get some rest, promising they'd continue the investigation in the morning. I knew better. It wasn't something they could deal with using traditional methods. I couldn't sleep that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw the creature's featureless face and the mangled body of the man. I decided to do some research, digging through old records and local legends. It took hours, but I finally found something. A series of unsolved disappearances dating back decades, all centered around Mount Rainier. The victims were all experienced outdoorsmen, vanishing without a trace. The few bodies that were found were in a similar state to the one I'd seen, torn apart as if by some powerful predator. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I contacted a local university professor, Dr. James Caldwell. He was an expert in cryptozoology, the study of unknown or mythical creatures. I told him my story, and to my surprise, he didn't dismiss it outright. Instead, he listened intently, his expression growing more serious as I described the creature. What you encountered sounds like a wendigo, he said, his voice low and grave. It's a creature from Native American folklore, said to be a malevolent spirit that possesses humans and turns them into cannibalistic monsters. But I've never heard of one this far west. We decided to return to the forest together, 
armed with more than just a rifle. Dr. Caldwell brought along cameras, recording equipment, and a tranquilizer gun, just in case. I wasn't sure what good it would do, but it was better than nothing. The next morning, we set out at first light, following the same path I'd taken the day before. The forest was eerily quiet, as if it knew we were coming. We reached the spot where I'd found the man, and Dr. Caldwell began setting up his equipment while I kept watch. Hours passed with no sign of the creature, and I started to think it might have moved on. Just as I was about to suggest we pack up, Dr. Caldwell's camera caught something. A movement in the trees, barely visible but unmistakable. We both tensed, watching as the creature emerged from the shadows. It was the same as before, but this time it didn't flee. It watched us with an unsettling intelligence, its head tilted to the side as if studying us. Dr. Caldwell raised the tranquilizer gun, but the creature let out a deafening roar and charged. I fired my rifle, hitting it in the shoulder. It staggered, but kept coming. Caldwell managed to fire the tranquilizer dart, hitting the creature in the neck. It stumbled, its movements becoming sluggish. I fired again, aiming for its head this time. The bullet hit its mark, and the creature fell to the ground with a heavy thud. We approached cautiously, keeping our weapons ready. The creature was still, its chest rising and falling with shallow breaths. Dr. Caldwell quickly set to work, taking samples and photographs. I kept watch, my eyes scanning the forest for any signs of danger. Just as we were about to leave, we heard a rustling noise. Another creature, smaller but similar in appearance, stepped into the clearing. It let out a mournful cry, kneeling beside the fallen one. Dr. Caldwell and I exchanged a glance, unsure of what to do. The smaller creature looked up at us, its featureless face somehow conveying a sense of anger and sorrow. It stood and began to back away, dragging the larger creature with it. We didn't try to stop it. We watched as they disappeared into the forest, leaving us with more questions than answers. Back in town, we handed over the samples and photographs to the authorities. They were skeptical, but the evidence was undeniable. The creature was real, and it was out there. The story made headlines, and people came from all over to see the evidence for themselves. Despite the attention, I knew the real danger was still lurking in the shadows. Dr. Caldwell and I agreed to keep searching, to find out where the creatures came from and how many there were. The next few weeks were a blur of research and more trips into the forest. We found traces of the creatures, but they were always one step ahead. It was as if they were toying with us, leading us deeper into their territory. Then one night, we got a break. A local hunter reported seeing a group of the creatures near a remote cave system. We gathered our gear and set out immediately, hoping this would be the lead we needed. The caves were hidden deep in the forest, accessible only by a narrow, winding path. We moved quietly, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The air was thick with tension, every sound amplified by the silence. We found evidence of the creature's presence, bones, strange markings on the walls, and a foul stench that made our eyes water. It was a nest, a breeding ground for these abominations. We set up cameras and motion sensors, hoping to capture more evidence of their existence. As we were leaving, we heard a noise from deeper within the caves. We turned, our flashlights revealing a massive creature, larger than any we'd seen before. It let out a deafening roar and charged towards us. We fired our weapons, but it was too fast. It swiped at me, knocking me to the ground. I felt a searing pain in my leg as its claws tore through my flesh. Dr. Caldwell fired the tranquilizer gun, hitting the creature in the chest. It stumbled, but didn't stop. I managed to get to my feet, firing my rifle at the creature's head. It fell to the ground, its body twitching as the tranquilizer took effect. We didn't wait to see if it would wake up. We grabbed our gear and ran leaving the caves and the creatures behind. Back in town, we handed over the new evidence to the authorities. This time, there was no denying the truth. The creatures were real, and they were dangerous. The town was put on high alert, and a team of experts was brought in to deal with the situation. In the aftermath, Dr. Caldwell and I became local heroes, but we knew the real danger was still out there. The creatures were not just animals. They were intelligent, cunning, and vengeful. They would not forget what we'd done, and they would come for us.
I decided to leave town to put as much distance between me and the creatures as possible. Dr. Caldwell stayed behind, determined to continue his research. I admired his bravery, but I knew I couldn't stay. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The forest seemed to close in around me, every shadow a potential threat. I knew this wasn't over. The creatures were still out there, waiting for their chance to strike again. A month later, I received a package in the mail. It was from Dr. Caldwell. Inside was a note, scrawled in shaky handwriting. They're coming, it read. I'm sorry. Along with the note was a photograph, a grainy image of a group of creatures gathered around a fire. In the center of the group was a figure, human in shape, but with the same gaunt gray skin as the creatures. It was Dr. Caldwell, or what was left of him. He had become one of them. I knew then that I could never escape the shadows of Mount Rainier. The creatures would always be there, waiting for me in the darkness. And one day, they would come for me, just as they had come for Dr. Caldwell. All I could do was prepare myself to be ready for the day when the shadows would finally catch up to me. Until then, I would live with the knowledge that the world was a much darker and more dangerous place than I had ever imagined. And I would never, ever go back to those woods again. My name is Dominic Faraday, and I've always had a knack for ending up in strange situations. Not that I'm complaining. Life's been a series of bizarre twists and turns for me, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Just the other day, I found myself in one of the most terrifying experiences of my life while out hunting in the dense woods of Maine. Let me tell you about it. I grew up in a small town where everyone knew each other's business. Hunting was a rite of passage a way of life passed down through generations. My father taught me how to shoot, track, and respect the land. Despite my love for the hunt, I never imagined I'd find myself on the receiving end of a deadly chase. It started as a typical morning. The sun had barely risen when I left my cabin, rifle slung over my shoulder, and my loyal hound Gus trotting beside me. The forest was our playground, a familiar expanse of towering pines and thick underbrush. We were out looking for deer, hoping to bring home some venison for the winter. Gus had caught a scent, and we followed it deeper into the woods than I'd ever gone before. The trees seemed to close in around us, the air growing colder with each step. It was as if the forest itself was warning us to turn back. But I ignored the feeling, too focused on the hunt. Around noon, we stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin I'd never seen before. It was odd considering I thought I knew every inch of these woods. The place was overgrown, the windows shattered, and the door hanging off its hinges. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to check it out. Gus stayed outside, sniffing around. Inside, the cabin was musty and filled with old, decaying furniture. Dust motes floated in the beams of light streaming through the broken windows. As I poked around, I found something strange— a series of journals scattered across a rotting table. The journals were written by someone named Ephraim Coulter, detailing his life in these woods and his encounters with a mysterious creature he called the Wendigo. I'd heard of the Wendigo before, a mythical creature from Native American folklore said to be a malevolent spirit that possesses humans and turns them into cannibalistic monsters. But I'd always dismissed it as just a story, a campfire tale meant to scare kids. Ephraim's journals were filled with descriptions of disappearances, mutilated animals, and eerie sightings. He wrote about how the creature stalked him, how it could mimic human voices to lure its prey. It all sounded like the ramblings of a madman, but there was an intensity in his writing that made my skin crawl. I was about to leave when I heard Gus barking frantically outside. His barks turned into yelps, and then there was silence, heart pounding, I ran out of the cabin calling for him. No response. Panic set in as I searched the surrounding area, but there was no sign of him. Then I saw the blood, a trail of it leading away from the cabin into the thickest part of the woods. I followed the trail, rifle at the ready, dread gnawing at my gut. The forest seemed to grow darker with each step, the shadows deepening and twisting into unnatural shapes. The silence was oppressive, 
broken only by the sound of my own ragged breathing and the crunch of leaves beneath my feet. The trail led me to a clearing, and that's when I saw it. The creature stood over Gus's lifeless body, its form obscured by the shadows of the trees. It was tall, emaciated, with limbs too long, and joints bending at unnatural angles. Its skin was a mottled gray, stretched tight over its bones. But the most horrifying part was its face, or rather, the lack of one. Where its features should have been was a smooth, featureless expanse of skin. I raised my rifle and fired, but the creature moved with inhuman speed, dodging the bullet and disappearing into the trees. I rushed to Gus, but it was too late. My best friend was gone, his body mauled beyond recognition. Anger and grief surged through me, and I swore I'd kill the thing that did this. Ignoring my better judgment, I set off after the creature. The trail was easy to follow, broken branches, fresh blood, and deep claw marks on the trees. As I delved deeper into the forest, the air grew colder, and an unnatural silence fell over the woods. No birds, no rustling leaves, just the sound of my own footsteps and the pounding of my heart. Hours passed, and the sun began to set, casting long shadows that twisted and turned like living things. I was exhausted, but I couldn't stop. Not until I found the creature and ended this. That's when I found the cave. It was hidden behind a thicket, almost invisible in the fading light. The stench of decay was overpowering, making my eyes water and my stomach churn. I ventured into the cave, the darkness swallowing me whole. The walls were damp and slick, the air heavy with the coppery scent of blood. As I moved deeper, I saw them. Bones scattered across the floor, some old and yellowed, others fresh and glistening with gore. This was its lair, a den of death and suffering. In the deepest part of the cave I found a grisly sight, two men, or what was left of them, hanging from the ceiling by their ankles. Their bodies were mutilated, skin flayed and muscles torn. One of them was still alive, his eyes wide with terror and pain. He looked at me, his mouth moving wordlessly, pleading for help. I moved to cut him down, but a guttural snarl echoed through the cave, freezing me in my tracks. The creature emerged from the shadows, its eyeless face turned towards me. In the dim light, I could see the blood dripping from its claws, the bits of flesh caught between its teeth. It was a nightmare made flesh, a being of pure malevolence. The creature lunged at me, its movements brutally fast. I fired my rifle, the shot deafening in the confined space. The bullet hit its mark, but the creature barely flinched. It slammed into me, knocking me to the ground, its claws raking across my chest. Pain exploded through my body, hot and searing. I fought back with everything I had, using my rifle as a club, smashing it against the creature's skull. But it was like hitting a wall of solid rock. The creature's strength was unbelievable, its resilience inhuman. It tossed me aside like a rag doll, my body smashing against the cave wall. Dazed and bleeding, I struggled to my feet, my vision blurring. The creature stood over me, its jaws opening wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth. I closed my eyes, waiting for the end, for the feeling of those teeth sinking into my flesh. But the end didn't come. Instead, a loud crack echoed through the cave, followed by an inhuman shriek of pain. My eyes snapped open to see the creature stumbling back, a gaping wound in its chest. Standing at the cave entrance was an old man, a smoking shotgun in his hands. He racked the slide, ejecting the spent shell, his face grim and determined. The creature snarled, turning its attention to the old man. They clashed in a flurry of movement, the old man moving with surprising speed and agility. He seemed to anticipate the creature's every move, dodging and weaving, his shotgun booming with each shot. I dragged myself to my feet, ignoring the pain that threatened to overwhelm me. I couldn't let this man fight alone. I grabbed my rifle and joined the fray, firing shot after shot into the creature's body. It howled in rage and pain, its movements becoming erratic, desperate. In the end, it was the old man who delivered the final blow. With a swift, precise movement, he plunged a hunting knife into the creature's throat, twisting the blade. The creature convulsed, black blood gushing from the wound, before finally going still. The silence that followed was deafening. The old man and I stood there, breathing heavily, our clothes soaked with sweat and blood. 
He turned to me, his eyes haunted but clear. We need to burn it, he said, his voice rough. It's the only way to make sure it stays dead. We built a pyre, piling dead wood and brush around the creature's body. The old man doused it with gasoline and set it alight. The flames roared to life, consuming the creature, reducing it to ash. We watched it burn, the smoke rising into the night sky, carrying with it the stench of death and fear. When it was over, the old man turned to me. My name's Jeremiah, he said, offering his hand. I've been hunting this thing for years, ever since it took my daughter. His grip was strong, his hands calloused from a lifetime in the woods. We walked out of the forest together, two strangers bonded by a shared trauma. Jeremiah told me his story, how the creature had stalked his family, how it had taken his daughter in the night. He had devoted his life to hunting it, to making sure it never claimed another victim. As for me, I knew my life would never be the same. I had seen true evil, looked it in the face and survived. But I also knew that I couldn't go back to my old life. Couldn't pretend that the world was the same place it had been before. In the weeks and months that followed, I threw myself into research, into learning everything I could about the creature and others like it. I pored over old books and faded newspapers, piecing together a history of disappearances and unsolved murders that stretched back centuries. And when the time came, I set out into the woods again, this time not as a hunter, but as a protector. I had a new purpose now, a mission to make sure that no one else would have to face the horrors I had seen. It's been years since that fateful day, but the memory of it still haunts me. Sometimes in the quiet moments, I can still hear Gus's barks, still see the creature's eyeless face looming out of the darkness. But I also know that I'm not alone that there are others out there like Jeremiah, like me, who have dedicated their lives to fighting the monsters that lurk in the shadows. And so I keep going, keep walking the long, dark path that I've chosen, because someone has to stand against the darkness to be the light that guides the way, and for better or worse, that someone is me. I always like to start my day with a good cup of coffee, the kind that warms your insides and gets you ready for whatever life throws at you. That morning in October 2023, though, I wasn't just gearing up for another mundane day. I was heading out for some peace and quiet in the Allegheny National Forest, a place I'd retreated to whenever the stress of life got too heavy. Just me, my Remington 700, and the vast expanse of nature. My name is Deacon Langley. And at 38, I've seen my fair share of the unusual working as a wildlife conservation officer. Maybe that's why I didn't immediately turn back when things started to get strange that day. I grew up in Warren County, Pennsylvania, a place where odd happenings were practically woven into the fabric of daily life. Missing pets, weird noises at night, and once, in 2019, a neighbor vanishing without a trace, their cabin found empty, dinner still warm on the table. The morning air bit at my face as I parked my Ford F-150 at the edge of the forest, just off Route 321. The weather report had predicted clear skies, but a heavy mist clung to the ground, weaving between the trees like ghostly fingers. I slung my gear over my shoulder standard hunting equipment, plus some extra supplies I'd learned to carry after 15 years in law enforcement. A satellite phone, first aid kit, and enough provisions for three days though I only planned to stay for one. The first hour passed uneventfully. The forest was alive with familiar sounds, chickadees calling overhead, leaves rustling in the October breeze, the occasional snap of a twig from some unseen creature. Then I found the first deer. The remains lay in a small clearing and something about the scene made my stomach turn. I'd seen plenty of predator kills in my time, bears, coyotes, even the occasional mountain lion. This was different. The carcass wasn't just eaten. It was desecrated. Deep gashes ran through the flesh in patterns that spoke of purpose rather than predatory efficiency. The ribcage had been split open from the inside out, as if something had burst through it. I knelt beside the carcass, pulling on a pair of latex gloves from my kit. The blood was fresh. Couldn't have been more than a few hours old. 
What struck me most were the teeth marks. They weren't consistent with any predator I knew. Some were clearly canine, but others, others looked almost human. My radio crackled to life, making me jump. Base to Langley, come in. Langley here, I responded, keeping my voice steady despite my unease. Just checking in, everything okay out there? I looked at the mangled deer, considering my words carefully. Found some unusual predator activity. Might want to send someone out to investigate when you can. Copy that. Want us to send back up? Negative, I replied. Though something in my gut told me I might regret that decision. I'll keep you posted. As I moved deeper into the forest, the familiar sounds began to fade. The chickadees fell silent. The rustling stopped. Even the wind seemed to die down, leaving behind an unnatural stillness that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Two more deer carcasses appeared within the next mile, each more grotesquely mutilated than the last. They formed a rough line, leading deeper into the forest, away from any marked trails. Whether by instinct or training, I found myself following this macabre breadcrumb trail. My rifle now held at the ready. The mist had grown thicker, reducing visibility to about 50 yards. Shadows played at the edge of my vision, always disappearing when I turned to look directly at them. The rational part of my mind said it was just tricks of light and fog, but 15 years of experience had taught me to trust my instincts, and every instinct was screaming that I wasn't alone. A low, guttural sound echoed through the trees, not quite a growl, not quite human. I froze, my finger resting lightly on the trigger guard of my rifle. The sound came again, closer this time, accompanied by the crack of breaking branches. Whatever was making that noise was big, and it was moving fast. This is Wildlife Conservation Officer Langley, I called out, hoping against hope that this was just some lost hunter. Identify yourself. The response was immediate, a roar that shook leaves from the trees followed by the sound of something massive charging through the underbrush. I raised my rifle, tracking the sound as it circled my position. Through gaps in the mist, I caught glimpses of movement, a dark shape, moving with impossible speed for its size. Then I saw the eyes. They glowed with an intelligence that sent ice through my veins, not the mindless hunger of a predator, but something worse, something that understood exactly what it was doing. The creature emerged from the mist, and my world shifted on its axis. It stood nearly eight feet tall, its body a twisted amalgamation of human and beast. Matted fur covered most of its frame, but patches of skin showed through, human skin, stretched and scarred over malformed muscles. Its face was the worst part, features caught between man and wolf, with a jaw that could unhinge like a snake's. I fired the rapport of my rifle deafening in the enclosed space. The creature jerked as the bullet struck its shoulder, but instead of falling, it smiled. The expression was so human it made my blood run cold. The attack came faster than I could process. One moment the creature was twenty yards away, the next it was on me. Claws raked across my chest, tearing through my jacket like tissue paper. The impact sent my rifle flying. I rolled with the momentum, coming up with my backup pistol, a Glock 20 loaded with solid copper rounds. I emptied the magazine into the creature's chest. Each impact drove it back a step, but it kept coming. Dark blood flowed from its wounds, but they were already beginning to close. This thing, whatever it was, could heal. It lunged again, but this time I was ready. I ducked under its swinging arm and drove my hunting knife deep into its side. The blade snapped off at the hilt, but the creature howled in pain a sound that started as an animal's roar and ended in a human scream. That's when I saw it, a metallic glint around its neck, a chain partially embedded in the flesh with what looked like military dog tags. This thing had been human once. Maybe it still was, somewhere inside. The realization cost me. The creature's claws found my leg tearing through muscle. I fell, pain shooting up my spine. This was it, I thought. This was how I died but the killing blow never came. Instead, the creature stopped, its head tilting in an almost quizzical way. It reached up with one massive hand and touched the dog tags. And for a moment, I saw something flicker in those inhuman eyes. Recognition, maybe even regret. Then its head snapped up, nostrils flaring. Something had spooked it. 
The sound of helicopter rotors reached my ears, search and rescue, responding to my last radio call. The creature looked at me one last time, and I swear I saw tears in its eyes before it vanished into the mist. The official report says I was attacked by a bear. That's what the higher-ups wanted to hear, so that's what I told them. They found the deer carcasses, of course, but blamed them on a pack of coyotes. The blood samples I collected mysteriously disappeared from the lab. But I know what I saw. Sometimes, on cold nights when the wind howls through the trees, I think about those dog tags, about the person who wore them and what they became. And I wonder, how many more are out there losing themselves piece by piece to something they never asked for? I still hunt in those woods, still carry my rifle and follow tracks through the underbrush. But now, I'm hunting for answers instead of game. And sometimes, when the forest goes quiet and the mist rolls in, I feel those eyes on me again, watching, waiting, remembering what it means to be human. The thing about horror isn't just the monster at the end of the trail. It's the weight of understanding that the world is bigger and darker than we ever imagined, and that sometimes the real monsters wear dog tags and carry the weight of terrible choices. I don't drink coffee anymore. These days, I need something stronger to start my day. The crisp Alaskan air bit at my face as I stepped off the small propeller plane onto the gravel airstrip. It was early June, and despite the near-constant daylight of the Arctic summer, a chill still hung in the air. I shouldered my heavy backpack, loaded with camera gear, and took a deep breath. The scent of pine and wild herbs filled my lungs, invigorating me after the long journey from my home in Seattle. My name is Wilder Johnston, and I'm a wildlife photographer. For as long as I can remember, I've been drawn to the untamed corners of the world, seeking out the creatures that most people only dream of encountering. It's not just about getting the perfect shot, though that certainly drives me. It's about the thrill of the chase, the raw connection with nature, and those rare moments when you realize you're witnessing something truly extraordinary. This particular adventure had brought me to the small town of Coldfoot, a remote outpost along the Dalton Highway in northern Alaska. With a year-round population of just 10 people, it was little more than a truck stop and a place for travelers to rest before pushing on into the true wilderness beyond. But for me, it was the gateway to my most ambitious project yet. As I made my way to the small lodge that would serve as my base for the next few days, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and trepidation. My goal was to capture images of the elusive wildlife in the Brooks Range, a vast expanse of mountains and tundra that stretched for hundreds of miles across northern Alaska. Grizzly bears, caribou, moose, all the iconic animals of the last frontier were on my list. But it was the wolves that had truly captured my imagination. In the lodge's small dining room that evening, I struck up a conversation with a grizzled local named Tom. His weathered face spoke of decades spent in this harsh environment, and I was eager to hear any insights he might have. Wolves, eh? Tom said, taking a sip of his coffee. Yeah, we got plenty of those up in the mountains. But if you're looking for something really special, you might want to keep your ears open for stories about the Wahila. I leaned in, intrigued. The Wahila? What's that? Tom's eyes twinkled with a mix of mischief and something darker, perhaps a hint of fear. It's an old legend among some of the native tribes up here. They say it's like a wolf, but bigger, much bigger, and it walks on two legs sometimes. I chuckled, assuming he was pulling my leg. Sounds like Bigfoot's arctic cousin. Laugh if you want, Tom shrugged, but I've been up here forty years, and I've seen things that don't have any right to exist. The Brooks Range is old country, wild in a way most folks can't understand. You be careful out there, young man. I nodded politely, but inwardly I dismissed his warning. I had heard similar stories in other remote areas I'd visited, local legends designed to spook outsiders or explain away perfectly natural phenomena. Still, as I headed to my room that night, I couldn't shake a faint sense of unease. The next morning, I met with Harlan McKenzie, 
the bush pilot I'd hired to fly me deep into the Brooks Range. He was a wiry man in his fifties with a no-nonsense attitude that immediately put me at ease. If anyone could get me safely into and out of the wilderness, it was Harlan. As we loaded my gear into his de Havilland Beaver, a sturdy float plane perfect for backcountry flying, Harlan ran through his pre-flight checklist. So where exactly are we headed? I asked, studying the topographic map spread across my knees. Harlan pointed to a remote valley about a hundred miles northeast of Coldfoot. There's a good-sized lake here that'll give us a place to land. The valley's got everything you're looking for. River, forest, open tundra, plenty of game trails. If there are wolves in the area, that's where they'll be. I nodded, excitement building in my chest. This was it. The kind of pristine wilderness I'd been dreaming of capturing on film. As we took off, the landscape below us transformed. The scattered trees and shrubs gave way to vast stretches of tundra, punctuated by winding rivers and crystal-clear lakes. In the distance, the jagged peaks of the Brooks Range loomed, still capped with snow despite the summer warmth. After about an hour of flying, Harlan's voice crackled through my headset. There's our valley up ahead. Take a good look. This is going to be your home for the next few weeks. I pressed my face to the window, drinking in the view. The valley was a photographer's dream. A winding river cutting through the center, flanked by dense forest on one side and open tundra on the other. Towering mountains formed a natural amphitheater around the valley, their snow-capped peaks reflecting the bright Arctic sun. As Harlan brought the plane down for a smooth landing on the lake, my heart raced with anticipation. This was true wilderness, untouched by human hands. Who knew what kinds of incredible wildlife encounters awaited me? Little did I know, as I helped Harlan unload my gear and set up my base camp, that this pristine valley held secrets far darker and more terrifying than anything I could have imagined. In the weeks to come, I would question everything I thought I knew about nature, about reality itself, and about my own sanity. But for now, as I waved goodbye to Harlan and watched his plane disappear over the mountains, I felt only excitement and a deep sense of peace. I was alone in one of the most beautiful and remote places on Earth, ready to capture its wonders on film. If only I had known what was watching me from the shadows of the forest, even then. Perhaps I would have begged Harlan to take me back to civilization. But hindsight, as they say, is 20 20th, and some lessons can only be learned the hard way. The first few days in the valley were a blur of activity. I spent hours scouting locations, setting up camera traps along game trails, and getting a feel for the rhythm of this untamed place. The silence was the first thing that struck me. A deep, profound quiet, broken only by the occasional call of a bird or the distant rush of the river. My base camp was situated on a small rise overlooking the valley, giving me a commanding view of my surroundings. I'd brought a sturdy four-season tent, designed to withstand the unpredictable Arctic weather. Despite the constant daylight of the Arctic summer, nights could still be brutally cold, so I'd packed plenty of warm gear. On my third day, I awoke just after midnight to a haunting sound, the howl of a wolf echoing across the valley. I scrambled out of my sleeping bag, fumbling for my camera. By the time I unzipped the tent, the howling had stopped but the thrill of knowing these elusive creatures were nearby kept me awake for hours. As the days passed, I fell into a routine. Mornings were spent checking and repositioning camera traps. Afternoons dedicated to long hikes with my handheld camera, searching for any sign of wildlife. The evenings I reserved for reviewing footage, charging batteries, and planning the next day's excursions. It was on one of these evening reviews, about a week into my stay, that I caught my first glimpse of something truly extraordinary. I was scrolling through images from a camera trap I'd set up near the river when a blur of movement caught my eye. I zoomed in, heart racing. There, partially obscured by the underbrush, was a massive wolf. But something about it seemed off. Its proportions were wrong somehow, its shoulders too broad, its legs too long. And its eyes, even in the grainy night vision image, they seemed to glow with an unnatural intensity. I shook my head, telling myself it was just a trick of the light, or perhaps a perspective issue with the camera. Still, 
I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that settled in the pit of my stomach as I stared at those glowing eyes. That night I dreamt of running through the forest, pursued by something I couldn't see but could feel breathing down my neck. I awoke in a cold sweat, the first tendrils of dawn creeping over the mountains. As the days wore on, my unease grew. It wasn't just the isolation. I'd worked alone in remote areas before and had always relished the solitude. This was different. A constant prickling sensation at the back of my neck, as if I were being watched. Movement glimpsed out of the corner of my eye, only to vanish when I turned to look. I'd tried to rationalize it, tell myself it was just the natural wariness that comes from being alone in bear country. But deep down I knew it was more than that. Something was out there, something that didn't want to be seen but was always watching. It was on day 12 that I found the tracks. I'd hiked several miles upstream, following the river to a series of small waterfalls I thought might make for good wildlife photos. As I was setting up my tripod on the muddy bank, something caught my eye. At first I thought they were bear tracks. The print was certainly large enough. But as I knelt to examine them more closely, my blood ran cold. The shape was all wrong for a bear. It looked more like a massive canine print. But the stride length suggested whatever made it had been walking on two legs. I fumbled for my camera, hand shaking as I snapped photo after photo of the tracks. My mind raced, trying to come up with a rational explanation. A bear with deformed paws? Some kind of hoax? But I knew, with a certainty that chilled me to my core, that these tracks were real, and whatever had made them was still out there, somewhere in the vastness of the Brooks Range. That night, as I huddled in my tent reviewing the photos of the tracks, I heard it again. That low, mournful howl. But this time, it was closer. Much closer. And there was something in its tone that spoke not of a wild animal, but of something other. Something that didn't belong in this world. I clutched my satellite phone, finger hovering over the call button. I could contact Harlan, have him come extract me first thing in the morning. But what would I tell him? That I was spooked by some weird tracks and my own overactive imagination? Pride won out over fear, and I set the phone aside. I was a professional, after all. I'd come here to document the wildlife of the Brooks Range, and I wasn't about to let some unexplained phenomenon scare me off. As I drifted into an uneasy sleep, I had no idea how drastically my world was about to change. In the coming days, I would face horrors beyond my wildest nightmares, and my very understanding of reality would be shaken to its core. But for now, I slept, unaware of the yellow eyes that watched my tent from the edge of the forest, biding their time. The next few days passed in a haze of nervous energy. I threw myself into my work with renewed vigor, as if by focusing on the task at hand, I could somehow ward off the creeping dread that had taken root in my mind. I expanded my search area, setting up additional camera traps and spending long hours hiking through the rugged terrain. The beauty of the landscape was undeniable, sweeping vistas of snow-capped peaks, meadows bursting with vibrant wildflowers, and the ever-present rush of the river carving its way through the valley. But even as I marveled at the raw wilderness around me, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was constant now a prickling sensation at the back of my neck that never fully subsided. I found myself jumping at small noises, whirling around to peer into the shadows between the trees. On the afternoon of the fifteenth day, I was checking a camera trap I'd set up near a small clearing when I heard it, a low guttural growl that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I froze, my hand instinctively going to the canister of bear spray on my belt. For several long moments I stood perfectly still, straining my ears for any further sound. But there was nothing, just the gentle rustle of leaves in the breeze and the distant call of a raven. As I turned to head back to camp, movement caught my eye. There, at the edge of the clearing, stood a figure. For a split second, I thought it was a bear standing on its hind legs. But as my eyes focused, I realized with a jolt of terror that what I was seeing was no bear. It was vaguely wolf-like in shape, but massive, easily seven or eight feet tall. Its fur was a mottled gray, matted in places and hanging in ragged clumps. But it was the creature's posture that sent chills down my spine. 
It stood upright on two legs, its front paws, hands, hanging at its sides like a grotesque parody of a human stance. And its eyes, God, its eyes, they glowed a sickly yellow in the fading light, fixed on me with an intelligence that was decidedly unanimal. I don't know how long we stood there, locked in that terrible staring contest. It could have been seconds or hours. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature turned and loped off into the forest, moving with a speed and grace that belied its massive size. I ran back to my camp, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst from my chest. As soon as I reached the relative safety of my tent, I grabbed the satellite phone and called Harlan. Harlan, I gasped as soon as he picked up. I need you to come get me. Tomorrow morning, first light. I can't... I can't stay here anymore. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. When Harlan spoke, his voice was calm, steady. Wilder, what's going on? Are you hurt? I took a deep breath trying to steady my nerves. How could I explain what I'd seen without sounding completely insane? I'm not hurt, I said finally, but I've seen something, something I can't explain. I don't feel safe here anymore. Harlan sighed. Listen, kid, I've been flying these parts for 30 years. I've heard all kinds of stories from folks who get spooked out there in the wild. Nine times out of ten, it's just their imagination playing tricks on them. Are you sure? I'm sure. I cut him off, my voice sharper than I intended. Please, Harlan, I need to get out of here. There was another long pause. All right, he said finally. Weather permitting, I'll be there at first light, but wilder. Be careful tonight. Whatever you think you saw, just remember, you're in bear country. Keep your wits about you. As I ended the call, a wave of relief washed over me. In less than twelve hours, I'd be out of this godforsaken valley. I'd go back to civilization, develop my photos, and try to forget about the terror of the past few days. But as the light faded and night settled over the valley, I realized my ordeal was far from over. The howling started just after midnight a chorus of unearthly wails that seemed to come from all directions at once. And underneath it all, I could swear I heard something else, something that sounded disturbingly like laughter. I huddled in my sleeping bag, clutching my rifle, and prayed for dawn to come quickly. But in the brook's range, in the heart of the Arctic summer, dawn was still many hours away. And in the darkness outside my tent, something was moving, waiting, watching. The longest night of my life had only just begun. The hours crawled by with agonizing slowness. Every rustle outside my tent, every snap of a twig sent my heart racing. The howls had stopped, but the silence that followed was almost worse, pregnant with a terrible anticipation. Around 3 a.m., I heard it, the sound of something large moving just outside my tent, the heavy tread of paws on the soft earth, the rasp of fur against canvas. I held my breath. Clutching my rifle so tightly, my knuckles turned white. A shadow fell across the tent wall, massive, upright, unmistakably the shape I'd seen earlier in the clearing. I watched, paralyzed with fear, as a clawed hand reached out, tracing the contours of the tent. In that moment, survival instinct took over. I lunged for my backpack, fumbling for the flare gun I kept for emergencies. Just as the creature began to tear at the tent fabric, I fired. The night exploded into brilliant red light. A bone-chilling howl of pain and rage split the air, and I caught a glimpse of the beast as it recoiled. Matted fur, yellow eyes wild with fury, teeth bared in a snarl that was more human than animal. I didn't wait to see more. I burst out of the tent, flare gun in one hand, rifle in the other, and ran. I ran like I'd never run before, crashing through underbrush, splashing across streams, my lungs burning as I gulped the cold night air. I don't know how long I ran or in what direction. All I knew was that I had to put as much distance between myself and that thing as possible. When I finally collapsed, exhausted, I found myself in a small copse of trees near the river. As I lay there gasping for breath, I became aware of a low, rhythmic sound. At first, I thought it was just the blood pounding in my ears, but as my breathing slowed, I realized it was coming from somewhere nearby. It sounded almost like chanting. Curiosity overcame fear, and I crept towards the sound. Through the trees I saw a flickering light, 
A campfire. Hope surged through me. Other people. I'd been so sure I was alone out here. But as I drew closer, that hope turned to icy dread. Around the fire sat three figures, their features hidden by heavy robes. The chanting was coming from them, a guttural, rhythmic sound that made my skin crawl. And there, just beyond the circle of firelight, stood the creature. Its yellow eyes reflected the flames as it swayed in time with the chanting, letting out occasional growls that sounded almost pleased. I must have made a sound, a gasp, a whimper, I'm not sure. But suddenly, all eyes were on me. The chanters stood as one, their robes falling away to reveal faces that were horrifyingly inhuman. Twisted parodies of wolves and men. The creature let out a triumphant howl and lunged towards me. I raised my rifle and fired once, twice, three times. The bullets struck home, but the beast didn't even flinch. It just kept coming. In that moment, I knew with terrifying certainty that I was going to die. But just as the creature's claws were about to close around me, the night sky erupted with light and sound. Harlan's plane roared overhead so low I could feel the heat from its engines. The beast recoiled, howling in fury and confusion. The chanting figures scattered into the woods. I ran towards the river where I could see Harlan's float plane touching down on the water. He'd come early, thank God. Maybe he'd heard the gunshots, or maybe some sixth sense had told him I was in danger. As I scrambled into the plane, I risked one last look back. The creature stood at the tree line, its yellow eyes boring into me with a hatred that chilled me to my core. Then Harlan gunned the engine, and we were skimming across the water, lifting into the air. I babbled the whole way back to Coldfoot, pouring out my story in a frantic, disjointed stream. To his credit, Harlan didn't interrupt, didn't tell me I was crazy. He just listened, his face grim. When we landed, he finally spoke. I've heard stories, he said quietly. Old legends from the native tribes. Things that live in the deepest parts of the wilderness. Things that shouldn't exist. He shook his head. I never believed them. Until now. In the days that followed as I recovered in Coldfoot, I developed my photos with shaking hands. Most were ordinary, beautiful shots of the landscape, a few blurry images of normal wildlife. But there was one, from the camera trap by the river, that made my blood run cold. A massive, upright figure caught in mid-stride, matted fur, elongated limbs, a face that was a nightmarish blend of wolf and man. And those eyes, even in the grainy image, they glowed with an unholy light. I have never shown that photo to anyone. I'm not sure I could bear the questions, the disbelief, the implication that it was all a hoax or a trick of the light. Sometimes, late at night, I take it out and look at it, just to remind myself that it was real that I'm not crazy. I haven't been back to Alaska since then. My passion for wildlife photography has dimmed, replaced by a wariness of the deep wilderness and what might be hiding there. I still work, still travel, but I stick to more populated areas now, places where the boundary between civilization and wilderness is clear and well-defined. But sometimes in my dreams, I'm back in that valley. I hear the howls, feel the weight of those yellow eyes upon me, and I wake up wondering, did I truly escape, or am I living on borrowed time, always one step ahead of something ancient and terrible that has marked me as its prey? I don't know if I'll ever have an answer to that question, but I do know this. There are things in this world that defy explanation, that shouldn't exist, but do. And sometimes the greatest mercy is in not knowing in being able to live in blissful ignorance of the horrors that lurk in the shadows of our world. As for me, that blissful ignorance is gone forever. All I can do now is live each day to the fullest, always looking over my shoulder, always wondering if today will be the day those yellow eyes find me again. I've always been a small-town guy, born and raised in Millbrook, Vermont, a tiny speck on the map nestled against the edge of Green Mountain National Forest. It's the kind of place where the hardware store doubles as the town's social hub, and everyone knows your business before you do. I'm Jake Hawkins, and this is my story. For as long as I can remember, I've worked at Millbrook Hardware, 
It's a family business, passed down from my grandfather to my father, and eventually to me. The store itself is nothing special. A weathered wooden building with a creaky screen door and shelves stocked with everything from nails to fishing lures. But it's ours, and it's been the backdrop to my life for the past 30-some years. Millbrook is one of those places where not much ever happens. The biggest excitement we usually get is when Old Man Johnson's tractor breaks down during harvest season, or when the high school football team makes it to regionals. It's quiet, predictable, and safe. At least that's what I always thought. I remember the day everything changed, like it was yesterday, though it's been a few years now. It was early autumn, that perfect time of year when the air turns crisp and the leaves begin their transformation into a kaleidoscope of reds, oranges, and golds. The forest that surrounds our town becomes a painter's palette, drawing tourists from all over New England to gawk at the foliage. That particular Saturday started like any other. I woke up at dawn, made a pot of coffee strong enough to wake the dead, and headed to the store to open up. The morning passed in a blur of customers buying last-minute supplies for home improvement projects before winter set in. By noon, things had quieted down, and I found myself leaning against the counter, idly flipping through a fishing magazine. The bell above the door jingled, and in walked Jack Thornton, one of our local hunters and outdoorsmen. Jack was pushing 70, but he still moved with the easy grace of a man half his age. His weathered face crinkled into a smile as he approached the counter. "'Morning, Jake,' he said, tipping his well-worn hunting cap. "'Got any of them new LED flashlights in stock? My old one's on its last legs.' I nodded, leading him to the camping supplies aisle. As I helped Jack pick out a new flashlight, we fell into our usual easy conversation about the weather, local gossip, and the upcoming hunting season. "'Say, Jake,' Jack said as we walked back to the register. "'You still do much hiking these days?' I shrugged. "'When I can. Haven't had as much time lately, what with running the store and all. Why do you ask?' Jack's eyes took on a mischievous glint. "'Well, I was thinking.' There's this old trail I used to know way up in the mountains. It's not on any of them fancy new maps, but it's a real beaut if you can find it. Thought you might be interested, seeing as how you like them challenging hikes. My interest was immediately piqued. I'd hiked most of the well-known trails in Green Mountain National Forest, but the idea of exploring a hidden path was intriguing. Tell me more, I said, leaning in. Jack lowered his voice as if sharing a secret. It's an old logging trail. Probably hasn't seen much use in decades. Starts about ten miles north of Bear Creek Campground. You gotta look sharp to spot it, but there's an old blaze mark on a big oak tree just off the main road. Follow that, and you'll find yourself on one hell of an adventure. He went on to describe the trail in detail, the steep inclines, the dense forest, and the breathtaking view from the summit. By the time he finished, I was already planning my hike in my head. Sounds perfect, Jack. Thanks for the tip, I said, ringing up his purchase. As he turned to leave, Jack paused at the door. Just be careful up there, Jake. It's wild country, and there's all sorts of critters about. Some folks say there's things in them woods that ain't natural, if you catch my drift. I laughed off his warning. After all, I'd grown up with the local legends and ghost stories. They were just that stories. Don't worry, Jack. I'll keep an eye out for Bigfoot, I joked. Jack's expression turned serious for a moment. You laugh, but there's more truth to some of them stories than folks like to admit. Just watch yourself, that's all I'm saying. With that cryptic remark, he left, the bell jingling behind him. I shook my head, amused by the old man's superstitions. Little did I know that his words would come back to haunt me all too soon. The rest of the day passed uneventfully. As I locked up the store that evening, my mind was already racing with plans for the next day's hike. I'd always been drawn to the solitude of the forest, the challenge of conquering a difficult trail. This new path Jack had told me about seemed like the perfect opportunity to push my limits and explore a part of the mountains I'd never seen before. That night, I meticulously packed my backpack with all the essentials, water, energy bars, first aid kit, map, compass, and an extra layer of clothing. I set my alarm for an early start, eager to make the most of the daylight hours. As I drifted off to sleep, I had no idea that the next day would change my life forever. The quiet, 
predictable existence I'd known was about to be shattered, replaced by a reality I never could have imagined. In the darkness of my bedroom, I dreamed of mountain vistas and hidden trails, blissfully unaware of the terror that awaited me in the depths of the green mountain forest. The next morning, I woke before my alarm, a mixture of excitement and anticipation coursing through my veins. The sun was just beginning to peek over the horizon as I loaded my gear into my trusty old Jeep and set out for the trailhead Jack had described. The drive took me deeper into the Green Mountain National Forest than I'd been in years. As I followed the winding road, the trees seemed to press in closer, their branches forming a canopy that filtered the early morning light. It was beautiful, but there was something almost oppressive about the density of the forest here. After about an hour of driving, I spotted the landmark Jack had mentioned, a massive oak tree just off the road, its trunk bearing the faded remnants of an old blaze mark. I pulled over, double-checking my supplies before setting out on foot. The trail was exactly as Jack had described it, barely visible, overgrown with years of disuse. I had to push through thick underbrush in places, the leaves still wet with morning dew. The air was crisp and clean, filled with the earthy scent of decaying leaves and pine needles. As I hiked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was the first person to set foot on this path in years. Fallen trees blocked the way in several spots, forcing me to climb over or find a way around. It was challenging, but I relished it. This was exactly the kind of adventure I'd been craving. The forest was alive with sound birdsong, the rustle of small animals in the undergrowth, the wind whispering through the leaves. Yet as I climbed higher, I began to notice something odd. The sounds were changing, becoming less frequent. By mid-morning, an eerie quiet had settled over the woods. It was then that I first felt it, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck, as if I was being watched. I stopped, listening intently, but heard nothing beyond the soft sigh of the wind. Shaking off the feeling, I pressed on, telling myself it was just my imagination working overtime in the unfamiliar surroundings. As the day wore on, the trail became steeper and more treacherous. I had to use my hands in places, scrambling over rocky outcroppings slick with moss. The physical exertion helped distract me from the growing sense of unease that had taken root in the pit of my stomach. It was early afternoon when I stumbled upon the clearing. Sunlight streamed through a gap in the canopy, illuminating a small meadow carpeted with late-blooming wildflowers. Under different circumstances, it would have been idyllic. But the moment I stepped into that open space, every instinct I had screamed danger. The silence was absolute. Not a bird called, not a leaf rustled. And there, just inside the tree line, was the deer carcass. Even from a distance I could tell something was wrong. The animal's body was torn and mangled in a way that defied explanation. No bear or mountain lion I'd ever heard of could have done that kind of damage. The flesh looked like it had been shredded, great chunks torn away by something with immense strength and ferocity. My stomach churned, and I found myself backing away involuntarily. Whatever had killed that deer was big, and it was vicious, and for all I knew, it could still be nearby. I debated turning back then and there, but a stubborn part of me insisted on pressing on. I'd come this far, and the summit couldn't be too much further. Besides, I reasoned, whatever had killed the deer was probably long gone by now. How wrong I was. The last leg of the climb was the most difficult yet. The trail all but disappeared, leaving me to pick my way through a jumble of boulders and stunted trees. My legs burned with the effort, and my lungs strained in the thin mountain air. When I finally broke through onto the summit, the view nearly took my breath away. Miles of unbroken forest stretched out below me, a sea of green dotted with splashes of autumn color. Distant peaks rose against the horizon, their tops wreathed in mist. For a moment I forgot my fears, lost in the majesty of the wilderness. I sank down onto a flat rock, pulling out my water bottle and a granola bar. As I sat there, catching my breath and soaking in the view, I felt a profound sense of peace. This, I thought, was why I loved hiking. The challenge, the solitude, the connection with nature, it all came together in moments like these. That's when I heard it, a low rumbling growl that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I froze, my half-eaten granola bar falling from suddenly numb fingers. 
Slowly, I turned my head, scanning the rocky summit. And there it was, half hidden in a stand of scrub pines about twenty yards away. At first, my mind couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. It was like my brain was trying to reconcile two impossible images, a wolf and a man, merged into one terrifying hole. The creature stood on its hind legs, easily seven feet tall. Thick, dark fur covered its muscular body, matted in places with what looked horribly like dried blood. Its head was that of a wolf, but larger and more fearsome than any wolf I'd ever seen. The snout was pulled back in a snarl, revealing rows of yellowed teeth that looked capable of crushing bone. But it was the eyes that truly paralyzed me, yellow and glowing with an unnatural intelligence. They fixed on me with a hunger that was all too human. In that moment, I knew with absolute certainty that I was looking at something that should not exist, something that bridged the gap between man and beast in the most nightmarish way possible. For what felt like an eternity, we stared at each other, predator and prey, locked in a frozen tableau. Then, with a roar that shook me to my very core, the creature charged. I'd like to say I had some clever plan, some heroic response. The truth is, blind panic took over. I scrambled to my feet and ran, abandoning my backpack and any pretense of facing this thing. I tore down the mountainside, my feet barely touching the ground as I half ran, half fell through the underbrush. Branches whipped at my face, Roots threatened to trip me at every step, but I didn't slow down. The sound of the creature crashing through the forest behind me spurred me on, terror lending me speed I never knew I possessed. At one point, I lost my footing on a steep slope, tumbling head over heels down a rocky embankment. I landed hard at the bottom, the breath knocked out of me, my body a mass of scrapes and bruises. For a horrible moment I thought this was it, I was done for. But the expected attack never came. I lay there, hardly daring to breathe, listening for any sign of pursuit. Gradually, I became aware that the forest had fallen silent again. No crashing footsteps, no terrifying roars, just the soft whisper of the wind through the leaves. After what seemed like hours, but was probably only minutes, I gathered the courage to move. Every muscle in my body protested as I slowly got to my feet. I was lost, having veered far off the trail in my panicked flight. My phone had no signal, and I'd left my pack with my map and compass back on the summit. What followed was the most terrifying journey of my life. I picked a direction that I hoped would lead me back to civilization and started walking, jumping at every snapping twig and rustling leaf. The sun was setting by the time I finally stumbled onto a marked trail and full dark had fallen before I reached the road where I'd parked my jeep. I've never been so glad to see anything as I was to see that beat-up old vehicle. I practically dove inside, locking the doors and sitting there for a long moment, shaking uncontrollably as the events of the day caught up with me. I didn't report what happened. How could I? Who would believe me? I told my family and friends that I'd gotten lost, taken a bad fall. It explained the cuts and bruises the haunted look in my eyes. But I knew the truth, and it changed me. I became jumpy, always looking over my shoulder. I couldn't sleep without reliving that moment on the mountain, seeing those burning yellow eyes in my dreams. I started researching, digging into local folklore and history. I found stories, old stories, passed down through generations, of things in the woods, creatures that walked like men but hunted like beasts, most dismissed them as campfire tales or the ramblings of isolated mountain folk. I knew better. I never went back to that trail, never hiked alone again, but I kept my ears open. Over the years I've heard whispers, hikers gone missing in remote areas of the forest, strange howls echoing through the mountains on quiet nights, livestock found torn apart in ways that defy explanation. Each time I think back to that day on the mountain, I remember the creature the impossible merger of wolf and man. And I wonder, how many are there? How long have they been out there, hiding in the dark corners of the wilderness? And most chillingly, how many of those missing hikers ended up like that poor deer I found in the clearing? I still live in Millbrook, still run the hardware store. To all outward appearances, I'm the same Jake Hawkins I've always been. But I carry a secret now a knowledge of something beyond the everyday world most people inhabit. 
Sometimes, on quiet evenings, when the wind blows down from the mountains, I find myself staring out at the darkening forest, and I wonder, is it out there, watching, waiting? I may never know for sure, but one thing is certain. I'll never look at those mountains the same way again. The wilderness I once saw as a playground is now a place of mystery and danger, and somewhere out there, in the deepest, darkest parts of the Green Mountain Forest, something is lurking. Something that defies explanation. Something that hunts. So if you ever find yourself hiking in these parts, stick to the marked trails. Don't go wandering off into uncharted territory. And if you hear a strange howl echoing through the trees, or feel eyes watching you from the shadows, don't dismiss it. Don't try to be brave. Run, run, and don't look back. Because there are things in these woods that no one should ever have to face. Things that blur the line between legend and reality. Things with burning yellow eyes and a hunger that can never be satisfied. I know, because I've seen them. And I'll carry that knowledge and that fear with me for the rest of my days. End of The Beast of Green Mountain, 